remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, He counts not their songs. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger. would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. So of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood beneath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. So praise the your name, O oh God, each day that I awake. From dawn to setting sun, your greatness I'll proclaim. Your glory far exceeds all human thought. So with each breath I bless your name, O oh God. Your name will be revered by children yet to come. And sing of the wonders you have done. Your strong and mighty deeds are always near. Oh God, your high your name will be revealed. How great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. How great is the Lord. the Lord and greatly to be praised. Your gracious hand provides for all who live and breathe. Your mercy runs to find the helpless and the weak. When we call out to you, you hear our cries and all our needs, your gracious hand.
nation will rejoice when the works of wicked men you finally destroy your power will proclaim till Christ descends and you will reign forever without end how great is the Lord and greatly to be praised how great is the Lord our God how great is the Lord and greatly to be praised greatly to be remain standing for the scripture reading. I'll be reading this morning from Psalm 73 in verses 25 to 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. And God bless the reading of his word. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rain. Living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Oh! 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your holiness, your righteousness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you for this church family and this time together. We ask, Lord, now that as we receive your word, we would have open hearts and open minds. We pray that your truth would permeate our lives and that we would make Jesus look beautiful to those who see and interact with us. I pray, Lord, that Jesus, our King, would be honored and exalted in this time together. We ask that you would grow this church, Lord, and grow your kingdom. It's in Jesus' precious holy name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody today? One person is good. Okay. <laughs> good morning. We're glad you're here to worship with us tonight, uh, this morning at New Life East. Uh, you all should have received a connection card, uh, one of these. I would like you to uh, fill that out card out or use the QR code on there if you're uh, able to do that with your device. Uh, if you're visiting with us, tear off the bottom of that card after you fill it out. Stop at the uh, welcome table out there. We've got a gift for you that we'd like to give you. Uh, for the rest of us, if you want to use that that uh, that bottom portion on the back, there's a space where you can fill out prayer requests and uh, or anything else that you'd like to check off there. And you can drop that in the gray box back there. Uh, or you can do all those things online. Uh, 
We're thankful for your faithful giving, those of you who do that. Um, there's three ways to give shown up there. You can text to give. You can use the New Life app. Or you can fill out an envelope and drop it in Mr. Graybox's parcel. Uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, we ask that you not give anything. We're just glad you're here and hope that uh, your worship experience with us is, is a good one today. Uh, I think now, oh, I wanted to mention a couple things. You'll find these congratulations class of 2023 handouts on the table back there. It includes the two graduates that we honored, uh, Abby and, and Caleb, a couple weeks ago. But it also has all the graduates from the Gahanna and Whitehall campuses. Uh, I know I like to get this because I see kids on there that I can't believe they're graduating. You know, especially these college graduates. A uh, couple people back there that I have known them since they were that big. And now they're graduating from college. Do you believe it? We also have a ton of these cards that you can use to invite guests to New Life East. Uh, grab some of those. Share them with your neighbors, friends. Uh, we had a great time Friday night at the uh, family camp movie night. Lots of guests here. And, uh, and they were all invited by Patrick, I think. They, every one of them. Uh, they, they, uh, there were a lot of, lot of young folks here, and I think everybody had a good time. Uh, Linda Thompson, come on up. You're the next announcement presenter here at New Life East. Linda has a couple words to say about a couple upcoming women's events. Good morning, everyone. Um, oh, is that a Christmas song? Is that what that is? <laughs> uh, it is, it is. Okay, ladies, uh, tomorrow evening at New Life Gahanna is the first night of the women's summer study. It begins at 7 p.m. It is a life accounts a study of Ephesians. Um, these studies never disappoint as many years as I've been going to them. So I recommend that you still register and plan to go. You know, even if you couldn't make every one of them, if you have plans for vac <coughs> excuse me, vacation or whatever, um, it's still good to go and do what you can. So again, that's at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. There is a cost of $10.00 and child care is provided. Um, second thing, on Saturday, June the 24th, um, that's a sa uh, Saturday morning at 9 o'clock till about noon, we are privileged to have Claire Robbins come and do a session for us on the gospel-centered wife. Um, Claire and her husband, Bill, served many years um, in marriage ministry and um, you know, now that Bill is gone on to be with the Lord, she is continuing on to minister to women. And um, we are very blessed that she is doing this. Um, there is no cost for this, and lunch will be pr provided, but you do need to register so we know what to plan for. So I think that's all for me. Oh, no, it is not yet for me. I, I forgot. Middle schoolers, you are privileged to stay here this morning but the elementary children can be released. So have at it. And greet er one another. Sorry.
come back to your if you come back to your seats. We will begin this part of our worship time. I'm glad you came this morning. Hope, hope that in about 30 minutes you will be too. And I uh, just want to mention two things here at the, at the beginning. Number one is uh, the men's breakfast next weekend. You should come if you were not invited to the women's stuff. If you're not invited to the women's stuff, guys, come on out. The highlight will be an omelet bar, and it's always a good time. I want to call your attention, if you would look at the note sheet, to our sermon title, and then right below that, what was the sermon title I wanted to use today, which was, uh, the, the, our actual sermon title is Life, Death, and Life to Come, which sounds all biblical, and it is, and sounds proper, and it is. But what I really wanted to call this sermon this morning was, you know, you're going to die one day, because that really is a little bit more... Um, interesting, I think, and you know, depending on where you are and what's happening in your life on a particular day, and, and, and honestly, you know, the, the reality of death in your world uh, these days. Thoughts about your own life, thoughts about people that you know, the passing of those who are close to you. You know, I don't, I don't want to be disrespectful at all, and that lands a different way if you're in the midst of that, if you're thinking along those lines. It's a bracing idea that you know you're going to die one day. And that bracing can be good for us. And this morning I want to encourage us to take a step forward into that bracing thought. Not so much to consider death, but to give a, um, a real consideration of what it is that Christians have always called our living hope. Last week I mentioned that I, I have this little journal that a couple times a week I'm in and... Um, that I keep in it a couple of reminders, um, a note from somebody who I, I helped perform the funeral for a, a young person. Uh, Linda mentioned Claire Robbins is going to come. I, I have the, the program from the funeral from Bill Robbins in here, and I have the program for the funeral from Ryan Steele in here. And it really isn't that I had such a close, close relationship with either of these guys. You all know, I, I only moved, we moved here coming up on five years ago. So um, I knew Ryan better than I knew Bill. But something I want in my life is I want a reminder of the brevity of life in front of me as much as I can. Because I'm prone to forget that this life is short and it will soon be passed. A pastor friend of mine um, many years ago told me, and I've mentioned this here before, he does this crazy thing. And I doubt he still does it because it is so crazy to me. Um, lives in Florida where it's hot, and sometimes early in the morning when it's not so hot, he will take a, a portable chair and he will go to a cemetery near him and he will sit in it and read his Bible and pray in the cemetery. Not visiting somebody's grave, just being where... Being where... Um, you can't help but think of the finality of death. Being where you can't help but think of the weightier matters of life. And when he told me that, I thought, that is one of the weirdest and honestly most morbid things I can <laughs> really imagine anybody doing on purpose. You mean you do this more than once? You, this is something you do? Yeah, I do. I, think, I said he brings a chair. He does it. There's, this is a cemetery that has like some benches set around, and he, he goes and sits somewhere and just uh, considers things in a weightier sense. And talks to the Lord and hears from him in his word. How familiar are you with death these days? How present is it? I know that in our congregation, just even here this morning, there are several folks who've had somebody recently pass who's in their life. Some family and friends. But I also know for others of us, you, you may have... Um, the opposite end of the spectrum, which is like, um, yes, I agree that, the, that the, the sitting in the cemetery thing is weird. And I actually kind of find it weird that you're carrying around, you know, programs from people's funerals with you. 
because I don't think about that sort of thing all that often. I don't really like to. I don't really want to. Or I just don't. It's not really what I think about. In the series we started last week about being able to live and pursue a life that is godly till the grave. I really don't think you can do that unless you have in front of you a big picture biblical view of your life. A big picture and biblical view of your life. There's three main points to that for every one of us. There's this life, there will be death and judgment, and there will be eternal reward for those who are God's people, the life which is to come. There's this life, there's ultimately coming death and judgment, and then there is eternal reward for the people of God, the life that is yet to come. So we're going to look at those three things this morning, and I hope with a perspective that gives you... um, a desire and an eagerness to lean heavily into the things that matter the most. If you open your Bible with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to be in verse 1. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we begin reading in verse 1. What I want to do is I want to read this passage, and, and then we're going to go back through and just pull out where, where Paul is talking about these three chapters, these three uh, points that we have to see to understand life the right way and maybe consider how they can be meaningful to us this morning. So in 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Paul writes, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The three points that are on your note sheet. The first one, the first thing you have to know you have going on in your world, and it's impossible to miss for all of us. A biblical view of your life starts with your life. Your current, present, living, waking, sleeping, eating, Day-to-day, 24-hour cycle, life. And Paul calls this life, in this passage, he calls it tent living. Tent living. He says, for if we, if we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, and he then contrasts the tent with a building from God in our eternal home. Your life, this life, is tent living. As a matter of fact, if we were to go back, and we will go back two chapters in 2 Corinthians, if you flip back, if you're looking in your Bibles, to, to chapter 3, verse 7. Um, how did I do that? I wrote down the wrong scripture reference here, and I'm not going to... Belabor it. I'm sorry that I did. I, I Actually, I don't know if you're aware of this. I rarely make mistakes. <laughs> I don't mean with sermon preparation. I mean in life. I mean with the music stuff we do and with the parenting stuff at home. I mean, I don't want to tell you how few mistakes I make in our marriage. I mean, I rarely make them. That's why it's so shocking to me when it happens. I don't, 
know what to say about that. No, it says chapter 3, but it's actually chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4, and we're going to begin in verse 7 here. Um, not just tent living, but Paul says here about our lives, because we have this treasure, the treasure of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the, the deepest and most wonderful things God has for us, and has given us through His Son. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And another way to translate a jar of clay is as a clay pot. This life is tent living. Your body, your earthly life, as you sit here with me today, whether you're super healthy or not, we are all just clay pots. The clay pot in the ancient world is like a, an image that was used for the frailty of life, for the weakness of life. I mean, clay pot wasn't even the best kind of vessel to hold something. There were fancier things, more valuable things. The clay pot, you just tip it over and it's going to be easily broken. This life, in all of its important stuff, everything that your hamster wheel runs on, and, 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 and you've got one because I've got one. Everything that occupies you, that is not of eternal value and connection to the life which is yet to come. Everything that is important in this life to you, your people, your future, your health, your finances, your happiness or lack thereof, etc., 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 your workplace. Whatever it is that gives you great pleasure, whatever it is that agitates you so much that it's like you've got a rash on your neck, it's like, I can't, nah, all of it. It's tent stuff. You just pull the pegs, just collapse in, it'll be done. It's clay pot stuff. It exists in weakness and in frailty. You know the word, like, we talk about superheroes, they are invincible. It's life that is very vincible. Everything about it is temporary. It's transient. But I just want to ask you a quick question before we move forward from this. It doesn't feel like that, does it? If you're not in a deep and growing and um, the streams of living water running through your life, the washing of the, the Word of God in and out of your mind and your heart, if you're not there, tent, clay, pot, transient stuff, it feels like it's everything. The whole world outside of Christ lives as if this tent life this clay pot life is everything. And it's so easy to be swept right into that. And the reason I carry around these reminders of death and that my crazy friend goes to the cemetery to consider his life is that what follows the tent life, the clay pot life, is certain death, and attached to it, the judgment of God that comes to all. So, if you look in 2 Corinthians 5 to verse 6, Paul writes, So we are of good courage, and we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now here is an interesting question for all of us. Two parts. Would you say, please don't raise your hand, because that wouldn't be helpful to this illustration. Privately considered. Would you say this morning that you yourself would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord? Would you rather be in heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth right now than sitting here with the rest of your days yet to unfold. Part one. Part two. 
Would you say in your life that you have ever felt that way? Deep down in your gut, in your bones. Because I have to be honest with you, and I was talking about this particular part with uh, uh, my daughter, Gracie, on the way in here today. We drove in together. I don't know that I'm thinking about this as much as I maybe used to. I don't know that I'm thinking about this with the sharpness that I w- should. But Paul talks about, I would rather be with the Lord. I would rather be with what comes next. But God's got me here. And I think that's a, cha- it's a challenging, it's a challenging truth to weigh out in your life. But in Hebrews 9.27, uh, it's stated very clearly that death is not just coming, but it's appointed. Death is appointed, and after death comes judgment. If you turn over to Hebrews, or if you would let me turn for you, Hebrews 9.27, it says this. Just as it is appointed, sorry, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that to face judgment. So Christ has been offered once to bear the sins of many and will appear a second time. So Paul's make, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews is making a, an analogy. He says, just like Jesus died one time and, and is coming a second time, that's the way it is that we know that we will die and then we will come before judgment. I'm not going to walk down the, the path very deeply of what God's judgment involves today. That's not the point of my sermon. But if you, don't, if you are not living your life somewhere in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind or in the middle of your mind or swirling around your mind with the truth that you are going to stand before God one day, if you're not doing that, I don't think you can live a godly life till the grave. You are going to stand before God one day. And if you're his son, and if you're his daughter, the sacrifice on the cross of Jesus The blood of Jesus shed for you. What we celebrate when we come to the communion table, that his body was broken for you, that his blood was poured out for you. That sacrifice, that punishment, that penalty, having already been paid, covers you. And that gracious truth is wonderful. And that freeing mercy is fantastic. But you know, like with with a young person, They're going to act a certain way if they know the authority's eyes are upon them. If they know that mom or dad, whichever one in that house, is heavier with their hand. If they know that mom or dad have their eyes on the situation. And that they know how many cookies are in the cookie jar. That kid's going to be a little bit less inclined to steal one. And they know that if the authorities' eyes are on them, they're also going to be motivated to a different kind of positive behavior too. That's just how we are. You're going to stand before God one day. Connected to death is judgment. And Paul wants to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And we aim to please the Lord with our death in view, knowing that our time of judgment attaches to it. Now, kids, I know the middle schoolers in here, we got a good little handful of you. In high school, whatever. If you're in here today and you're not normally here, here's the thing. No matter if you're a Christian school person, a public school person, a homeschooled person, or what I hope isn't necessarily the case for any of you, an unschooled person, where you're not learning one thing as you grow up at all. Whatever you are, kids, however you are. And I'm also talking to the grown-ups and talking to these kids. Your whole life will look different if you know that your life right now isn't the only life you're going to live. 
We're living this life, and Paul calls it a tent life. He calls it a clay pot life. And, and we're all going to have a point where we end this life, where we breathe our last breath. What comes next? Because the biblical promise of the life to come is a bigger deal in the Bible than it is in most of our minds. 2 Corinthians 5, back at the start of it, Paul says, in verse 1 and 2, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, he says, we know that if and when we die, we know that the, if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building, not a tent, we have a building from God, a house not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. In this tent we groan, longing to put on our, human, our, our heavenly dwelling. I asked, I asked about the, if how you think about this earlier. He says, we'd rather, be, we'd rather be with the Lord and away from the body. He's saying, I would rather have the building from God not made with human hands that lasts forever. I'd rather be there. I'd rather have that. So we groan, longing to put on the heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. And this is why I read this passage again, these words right here. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So let's talk about the life that is to come for the people of God. Any, to use a very old term, very old language here, any poor, wretched sinner whose life is covered under the blood of the Lamb. Anyone who has simply looked to Jesus that they might live. What lies in store for that person is that what is mortal will be swallowed up in life. And at this point in the sermon, I'd like to ask you to stop the inevitable thinking about the other people. Because whenever I've listened to a sermon they're talking about these things, I, I inevitably think about certain people. Mainly, Correct me if I'm wrong. You, well, don't correct me, actually. That'd be kind of awkward. Mainly, when I start to hear this kind of teaching or sermon, I think about the people who really need to hear it in my life. Oh, man, I so want so-and-so, and I am praying for this and that, that they might also know this. I just want to ask you to block that and think about yourself. That there's coming a day for you when this tent life is over and where death has happened, and you have stood before God and been found forgiven in Jesus Christ and been found worthy because of the worth of Jesus Christ and have been rewarded because of the merits of Christ and also, according to Scripture, because of the, uh, the, 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 the things of your life that are not burned off, that had eternal value. And now you are in the life to come where your mortal life has been swallowed up by a new kind of life. That's what we look forward to. Our heavenly dwelling is a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul says we'll be swallowed up by life. And for the rest of my sermon, I want to just go to the Bible from Genesis, the third chapter of Genesis, but the first story in the Bible. to Revelation 21, in the last episode of the Bible, of John talking about what is yet to come. And I just want to, like, highlight the tangibleness, the reality-ness of the life which is yet to come. I don't know that you need to, like, try to flip around in your Bible with this, but these passages, the, the Scripture references would be great ones to write down. These would be great ones to write down. They track the core of the Bible's teaching about heaven. The first one comes in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 1 through 3 is the, the account of the creation and of Adam and Eve. And Genesis 3 is where Adam and Eve have sinned, and now God is talking with them, and God is explaining the consequences of their rebellion.
rebellion. And not just to Adam and Eve, but also to the serpent. In Genesis 3, 14 and 15, God says this. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, deceived Eve, right? Deceived Eve and allowed both Adam and Eve, through his deception, to step away from the cover of obedience to the Lord. Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Now here's where this, the enmity that God puts between the offspring of Eve speaks forward to one specific offspring. Put enmity between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of Eve. Ultimately, the one day offspring of Eve would be Jesus. And that's how, that's how this has always been interpreted, both before Christ came and specifically by Christians, that this looks forward to the offspring of Eve who would one day come to set these things right. And the reason why that is is because he then goes on to say, I'll put enmity between your offspring and her offspring. And he, singular, he will bruise your head, or in other translations, those of you who've been around a long time, you know that it's translated in some other translations, and he will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. Genesis 3, 14 and 15 has a prophecy. God says to the serpent, you will always be at odds with the offspring of Eve, but one day he will bruise, will crush your head. Well, how do you do that? Okay? One time, we talk, I had a conversation about snakes last night, and I mentioned how we had a rattlesnake in the backyard when I was a kid in South Florida, and my dad had to kill it with a shovel. That might be the better way to think about the crushing of the head of a serpent. Boom! Okay? It's what you have to do. You've got a venomous snake coming at you. God promises in Genesis 3, that's going to happen one day between the offspring of Eve, Jesus, and you and your offspring, Satan. The beginning failure story of the Bible has a promise in it that God will be victorious through Jesus. Heaven is where that will ultimately be forever. And then a long time later in Isaiah, in Isaiah 65, he prophesied, he wrote this, he said, Behold, and speaking for the Lord, God is the voice speaking in this, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. From Isaiah, we go to, we go to Revelation, where the same words are used. Where the Apostle John writes, this is the final vision. This is chapter 21, 22, the final visions of Revelation. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I just want to pause there. In the Old Testament, the prophets calls heaven the new heavens and the new earth. In Revelation, the Apostle John calls heaven the new heavens and the new earth. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he, he's been talking about the day of the Lord. And then he says this, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? in lives of holiness, holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming, day of the, Lord, the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In Genesis, we're talking about the new heavens and the new earth. The Apostle Peter is talking about the new heavens and the new earth. Apostle John, at the end of Revelation, is talking about the new heavens and the new earth. 
the, there's factors in this, but the way most of us think about heaven is very immaterial. The way most of us think about heaven is very cloudy, as opposed to sharp. Yes, that's going to happen someday. But I think what happens for a lot of us, even a lot of us faithful Christians, we know that's out there. And that building from God will be great. And that heavenly dwelling will be awesome. And when we get there, maybe we'll understand it better than we do right now. Because right now, what we really understand is we have bills to pay. We have kids to raise. We have people in our life that need our contribution. We have, we have, for those of us who are older, we've got kids we've already raised and we've got to watch how they do it. We've got helpful to them. We've got health concerns to navigate. We've got whatever. This tent life, this clay pot life is so much sharper, so much realer. And there's one sense in which it has to be that way. I'm telling you something. If you woke up this morning and you were reminded in God's word or by a song that you had playing in the kitchen or, or in prayer, and this was just something that you, you regularly rehearse in your prayers to the Lord, that there is a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. That there's a new heavens and a new earth where Jesus is fully victorious, having crushed the head of the serpent. If you remember that there's a new heavens and a new earth, where this is from, this is from Revelation, this is what John said, that, he, that, that in that day he heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. If you woke up reminded that the primary and core and central promise and idea about the future in the Bible is not anything less than the full restoration at the end. That will be in quality and goodness, just as good and just as pleasing as the Garden of Eden. But it won't just be one couple in the garden. It will be a holy city coming down out of heaven from God. And if you, if you read Revelation and you start reading through and trying to map out exactly what it's going to be like, Hopefully, you're going to realize, man, there's a lot of symbols here. There's a lot of pictures here. Hopefully, I think it's, it's very help, I think it's healthy to think this way about Revelation. I don't know that I understand all of this. As a matter of fact, I don't know that I understand most of this. And, and that if you study deeply, you can gain a grasp. But I'm talking about just in general, I don't know everything about what God has in store for me. In fact, in terms of the contrast between how I know my tent life versus how I know the building from God and the eternal dwelling life, I don't know much. But I know there's a new heavens and a new earth promised to me because I belong to Jesus and that everything in that life is good. There's no mourning, there's no crying, there's no pain. The former things are passed away. And it talks about in Isaiah, we will remember the former things no more. So what I believe about the new heavens and the new earth, that there's no regret. And there's no sense of the undoneness of things. There's a perfect place for me. There's a perfect existence coming. And it is going to be wonderful. And it is going to be amazing. And if you live with a sense of, you know, you're going to die one day. But right next to that, you have a sense of the goodness and the thoroughness and the fullness of the life that is yet to come. You have the mental geography to enable godliness to the grave. When Christians lose the sense of eternity, 
when, when Christians lose their sharpness around these three events for their life, this life in the tent, death, and attached to that God's judgment, and being found forgiven in Jesus Christ, and then ultimately the life that is yet to come in the new heavens and the new earth. Christians that forget those chapters will ultimately end up living tent-focused and, I would say, carnal lives where the, f- the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, where the world and the devil and the flesh, the enemies of our intimacy with God, rise up, you have no defenses. Godliness to the grave is a nice concept and it won't happen for those who don't have these three events clear in their heart. But listen, for those of us who do, when when funerals and considering death in others' contexts, when we consider our own frailty, mortality, and we remember right next to that, good things are coming for me because I belong to Jesus. Your life can be powerful in the Spirit. In the back of your note sheet, there's these two closing thoughts. From the passage in 2 Peter 3, Peter wrote this. He said, In view of these things, the coming day of God, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Of godliness of the grave, you've got to have the whole picture. And so I want to ask the worship team to come on forward, and I want to finish as they do and get set. I want to finish with just this one thought to you. So actually, it's a question to you. We talked about this morning something that most of us know. And I know for some of us, it, it lands today jarringly because we are in the process. We're close to death right now. For others of us, it, lasts, it, it lands sort of like dissonantly because I, I don't think about that stuff. But if it's true that from Genesis to Revelation, there's a promise of a new heaven and a new earth. And if it's true that is so fully good that while it may be cloudy to us now, it will be so sharp and real. And if all of it is true, and if you can access it in your life, if you can get a little bit of a greater grasp on it than you had before I started talking this morning, what sort of person ought you to be? If you weigh this life's concerns as tent living, and you weigh the concerns of eternity as a building from God, eternal in the heavens. What sort of person ought you to be? I'm not wearing my wedding, my wedding ring this morning. Our marriage is fine. Jenny's here this morning. Everything's great. But when I went to sleep last night, I, I, it was, my ring was bothering me. I, I took it off. And I set it on the bedside table. This may be, this may sound strange and, Super, supernatural, but when I set it down, I set it down on the base of the le- this little lamp that I have, and it started, it fell off, and it started to roll. Okay, I heard it rolling. I heard it rolling. It was dark, and I'm like ready to fall asleep. <clears throat> it started rolling, and all of a sudden, it stopped rolling, but there was no thud. It's like, like, it was like in Lord, uh, Lord of the Rings. It was just gone. <laughs> Seriously. And I'm like, I'm going to need to go find that right now, because if I don't find it right now, I will not find it, you know, in the morning. Sunday mornings are very busy, and, you know, whatever. So I got out of bed. I get my light, you know, on my phone, and I get down looking for this ring. And I'm telling you, I looked hard. I moved that table. I looked under the skirt of the bed. The cat was under our bed. That kind of freaked me out. I didn't expect that. And <laughs> I'm looking for the ring, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> I know it's there. I know it's there. But there's just something that's not right about having your wedding ring on. And I'll tell you this, especially if you're going to be on a stage talking to people and preaching, like, why is he not wearing his wedding ring? What's happening? That's supposed, is there a problem? There's no problem. But it's not right, right? It's not right. It's off. I ought to have my wedding ring on. It's too bad it supernaturally disappeared from me (laughs) late in the evening. What sort of person ought you to be if all of this is so. 
Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would give me grace, give each of us grace to pursue a life that is godly to the grave, full of the hope that eternity can give us, that the living hope of Jesus Christ, victorious, and us united with him in resurrection life in a way that we can't even understand, could be just a little bit more real to us this morning. That that call to live lives of godliness and holiness could be just a little bit more real to us this morning. And as we sing this last song, that you would help us appropriate this truth to our current life and all of our struggles. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand. If you're able, and we'll sing one final song together. Still to Jesus I hold as I face every step, for the Lord he will give me his peace. Bless the Lord, he will give me his peace. Bless the Lord, he will give me his peace. And if I should remain in the body, Bless the Lord, he will give me his peace. When the road that I tread fills my heart with despair, and it seems that my grief has no end, still to Jesus I hold, who will walk with me there? Bless the Lord, he will give me his strength. Bless the Lord, he will give me his strength. And if I should remain in the valley today, bless the Lord, he will give me his strength. So to you I shall hold, you redeem every loss, for my Lord you have given yourself. Bless the Lord, for he gives me himself. Bless the Lord, for he gives me himself. And if I should remain in the valley, Gives me himself. Bless the Lord, for he gives me himself. Bless the Lord, for he gives me himself. And if I should remain in the valley today, bless the Lord, for he gives me himself. Bless the Lord, for he gives me himself.
last work in God's word this morning is from Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. This and this and this and that destroy it. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where your treasures are safe for eternity. That is a paraphrase, but I do know that. It just came to my heart, so I wanted to share it that way. Lay up your treasures in heaven. That's good news. It gives us direction for our lives. Thanks for coming this morning. I hope you have a great Sunday.